everybody, Will from Rebel Remote Motorcycles here, and today we are uh, going to show you the answers to a whole lot of the common questions that we get on our big bore video. Uh, I happen to have a big bore job on the bench today, and we thought perfect opportunity to get the camera out and answer some of those questions. So we're going to start with cleaning up the cylinders. The first thing is when you get a new cylinder from a manufacturer or these big bore cylinders back from the machine shop, um, they appear to be nice and clean. They'll come out, they will have a cursory clean and generally they'll be covered in uh, machine oil or honing oil. Now this looks like a clean cylinder, but it's got honing oil or you know cleaning oil all over it and the bore feels fairly clean but you'll find that in reality it's not really clean enough uh, to assemble let's look at how we do that we prefer to clean these cylinders in warm soapy water with a nylon cylinder brush like this one from brush research you want to use water just as hot as you can stand it and a dishwashing liquid specifically designed to remove oil and grease you also want to clean the bare metal surfaces, like the gasket surfaces, as well. You don't want anything left on these surfaces that can prevent the sealants from doing their job. Then, you want to get the cosmetic surfaces and the fins while you're at it, especially if you're planning to paint these cylinders. Once we have all the oil off, we blow it completely dry, starting with the cylinder bores so they don't have a chance to rust. Then we come back with wax and grease remover and just work all the gasket surfaces. You'll find that even after all that, the wax and grease remover will still remove quite a bit of gunk. You really want these clean and dry to the point that nothing else comes off on the towel. Okay, so it looks like these cylinders are pretty clean now. They're all cleaned out with warm soapy water and blown dry with air. They look like they'd be ready to assemble. Well, here's the trick. They're really not. Take a nice, clean, as lint-free as possible, preferably paper towel, and put engine oil on it. The oil that the engine's gonna be assembled with is probably best. Let that soak in a little bit and just mop that cylinder with that clean towel and the oil that's gonna be in the engine I'm using a fair bit of pressure on this and you want to watch it because the edges of this cylinder are really pretty sharp and you can cut yourself but you see the stuff that's coming off on that towel All right. same thing from the other side you just repeat this process with both cylinders until that towel comes out clean. All right, so that's what was left on it after it had been cleaned at the machine shop and cleaned again in warm soapy water. And that's what it shows after it's had fresh clean motor oil mopped in it until you don't get anything else off on the towel. Now that cylinder's ready to assemble, not until. If you leave this, in that cylinder, it will chew up pistons and rings pretty quickly. Now that you have your cylinder all cleaned up, oiled up and ready to assemble, before you can assemble it, you have to establish that you have adequate piston ring end gap. Now, that is for a 90 millimeter bore like these 865s, for the top two rings, that's a minimum of uh, 0.35 millimeters, so about 14 thousandths of an inch. Uh, and you establish that end gap or measure it by setting the ring in the cylinder and being sure that it's straight in the bore. So we just ease it down in there with the piston until it's nice and straight. And then you're going to measure that gap. It needs to be at least 0.35 millimeters or 14 thousandths of an inch. So this gauge has to go. And it does. Now, a little more is fine. Uh, a little less, not okay. So a little extra end gap is not a bad, not necessarily a bad thing. Too little end gap is absolutely a bad thing. Uh, your oil expander rings 
or sorry, the oil scraper rings, not the expanders, uh, also need to be checked, but they have to have, in every case, when the bore is correct, they have to have at least 10 thousandths of an inch, which is 0.25 millimeter. Uh, so they're not the same spec as the top two rings, but they have to have at least that gap. Let me get that straight again. I mean, I know the camera saw it, but I need to see it. <laughs> yeah, there. They are. It's just at 10. So, but they're okay. And you have to check absolutely every ring. It's best to check that ring in the cylinder that it's going to be running in. And there you have it. Now we're ready to assemble the pistons uh, and get them in the cylinders. So that starts with understanding the orientation of this piston and which one it is. That has got to go to the front. And this cylinder, the way it's sitting now, is upside down. This is the inside and this is the exhaust side. So intake side and exhaust side. So that makes this, even though it's on my right hand now, this is the left cylinder and that's the front of the left cylinder. I'm going to put this piston in the left side. So I'm just going to mark in here so that as I'm handling parts, I know which is which. So I've got myself a little mark that, so I can keep track of which piston is which. This is going to be the left hand cylinder and it's important that I index that because I'm going to put the piston pin in it first and the piston pin that I, the piston pin clip that I put in this cylinder, this is going to go this way in that cylinder. So I need this clip in first. I'll put this one in as we assemble it to the bike, but I need this one in the piston before. So, and we just Gently push that into place. So now we've got a clip in one side. We'll put the piston in. We'll set the whole cylinder assembly on the bike and slide the other piston through. So we start by putting the piston pin clip in. Then we want to orient the rings. Now, this is going to be the exhaust valve side. You want the gaps of the rings at least 45 degrees off the center of the thrust face, both front and rear. So we'll start the oil rings with one of the gaps here. We'll put the expander gap there and the other oil ring gap over here. And then we'll put the second ring on with a gap here and the first ring on with a gap over here. So that you've got the gaps in the rings staggered all around. So we'll start with the expander for the oil ring and just put that bad boy in there and we want that gap that is right there around to this side. So we want it, you know, you want the, the ring gaps here and staggered. So that one's there. We'll put this one over here. That's the oil ring going on under the expander. And then we'll put this one over here. That's the oil ring going on over the expander. Then our second ring has a mark on the ring. That mark needs to go up because this ring is tapered. It is designed to help the oil rings as this piston travels down in the cylinder. It's, it helps the scrape the oil off the side of the cylinder. And then when it turns around, this ring flexes and goes flat against the cylinder to aid the top ring in sealing the combustion chamber. So it's very directional and you don't want to put it on upside down. If you put it on upside down, it will scrape oil up into the combustion chamber and automatically make an engine that uses oil. So let's see, where was my last, uh, Right, my last oil ring gap is there, so I'm going to put, so I've got my last oil ring gap there. I'm going to put the gap in this ring right here. And then the gap in the top ring on the other side. Now you notice I don't put the gaps in either of the top two rings on the exhaust side because you've got more heat over here. So I try to keep the top two ring gaps, and this also has a mark for up and down, right? And this is a round faced chrome molly ring. That gap right there. 
Oops. So there are my rings. Top ring gap there. Second ring. Top ring gap there. Second ring gap here. And then my oil ring gaps are here, here, and my or sorry, my oil ring gaps are also here, here, and my expander gap is there. So that piston is ready to oil up and put in the cylinder. So now the cylinder's nice and clean and my hands are nice and clean. And I'm just mopping a little bit of oil in that cylinder. And I'm gonna do the same on the surface of these rings all the way around. Just a little bit of oil on the rings. Uh, there's no, you know, uh, a lot of mechanics just mop oil in there and that's fine there's no there's kind of no such thing as too much oil it's okay if you want to just load it up with oil uh, i prefer not to do that just because it's so messy when you're installing it and we take our piston ring compressor it has a straight edge and a bevel edge the bevel edge is going to go this way against the piston because we want this against the cylinder so the rings don't expand as it goes down so we're just going to take this, slide it over those rings. Right. And we take that whole assembly. That's forward. That's the exhaust side. Clips on the inside. We line that up, ease the piston down to the first ring and just, it's that simple. Now we take this guy pin in there and bring the piston back up just to the point that the pin is against the base of the cylinder so that now we can put the other piston in then we take this whole assembly set it on and just put it put the rod in it put the pin through put the clip in it and we're done okay first thing we want to talk about is these dowel pins there are four of these in the assembly. Two of them go between the crankcase and the cylinder, and the other two go between the cylinder and the cylinder head. Um, now, this, is, this bears mentioning because folks are buying these kits where they're buying complete cylinder assemblies already machined. Uh, take it off the engine, these dowel pins very often come out with the cylinder and or cylinder head. Uh, and we are aware of some engines that have managed to get assembled without dowel pins at the cylinder base. Now, the problem with that is that those dowel pins are entirely responsible for establishing the center line of these cylinder bores to the rods and the crankshaft. So without those dowel pins, this whole cylinder assembly can move around dramatically. And what happens when you torque that down, um, not only are the pistons and, and rings uh, not running straight with the rods uh, in the cylinders, but as it heats up and cools off uh, and you put it under power, this moves around and just destroys the base gasket. So it leaks oil, uh, ultimately it'll leak combustion chamber pressure. It can result in catastrophic engine failure. So understanding that these dowel pins are there and they need to be, um, and that they are in fact critical, um, is a little thing that you need to pay attention to. The dowel pins must be there. Now, before we move on to the gaskets, there's a potentially critical issue uh, that we want to show you. Because these big bore cylinder liners are so much larger in diameter than the standard liners, and the crankcase castings can be inconsistent, you absolutely must check the cylinder liner clearance to the crankcase. Uh, to do that, you just take the cylinder with no base gasket and drop it gently onto the dowel pins and it should drop down and go straight to the bottom just like that without any interference. If you find you need to move this around, press on it, or it doesn't go straight down and just drop down onto the pins to the gasket surface, then you need to pull that cylinder back off 
and you'll be looking for marks on these cylinder liners roughly here and or marks in the crankcases where those cylinder liners have touched them there and over here usually. Uh, the ones that we've seen, some of them only, only touch a little bit, and we've seen some that you literally couldn't get the cylinder to go down. You had to force it down. So it is something, they, they are fairly inconsistent, and it's something that needs to be checked. If you find you've got a cylinder that, that does have interference there, uh, you'll need to remove material from the crankcases, wherever they're touching. Uh, and in an engine that's assembled, we do that uh, by packing rags in there and using a draw file and a shop vac. If you have interference here and you go ahead with final cylinder assembly without correcting it, the engine will probably still turn over and it will likely start and run fine. But it distorts the bore and over time it can result in a damaged piston. It's a small thing to check, but a big problem if you miss it uh, and it needs to be clearanced. So, now you know that, now we can move on to gaskets. Okay, we get a lot of questions around the gaskets. So, before we are actually start showing you the how to deal with these gaskets, I think it's important to show you the why. Uh, the gaskets are there, the base gasket obviously is there to seal oil, and the head gasket's there to seal both compression, combustion chamber pressure and oil. Um, but where is the oil really that it's got to seal and you, you really have to be uh, aware of that and cognizant of how the oil moves around uh, in this engine to, to understand what it is you're trying to do with these gaskets. So the high pressure oil comes up out of the crankcase out of these holes right between the two intakes. It moves from those holes into here in the cylinder and across to the cylinder studs and goes up to the cylinder head on the intake side. So oil, pressure fed oil is going through these two stud holes. This is your engine oil temperature sensor. Then when they come out the other side of those holes, comes up through a galley into these jets, which uh, regulate the pressure fed oil that comes up into this cam journal and is fed into the rocker arm tower here and goes up through the rocker arm tower bolts out into the rocker arm shafts and then exits the rocker arms in these holes there there and there and once the oil comes out of the cam journals and rocker arm shafts it's no longer pressure fed oil now it's return oil uh, and splash and drip so that oil that comes out after it's no longer pressure fed is all over the place and it's all got to return from this cylinder head back down through the cylinder to get back down into the crankcase through these holes. So these four holes are all return oil that's moving back down into the crankcase. All of that has to be managed by your cylinder base gasket and head gasket. So let's take a look at those. Okay, first thing to talk about is the base gasket. And I think the question we probably get most often about the base gasket is uh, either what sort of sealant do I use on it or what do I use to stick it to the cylinder while I'm assembling it? Uh, and the answer to both is neither and none. Uh, this base gasket goes on absolutely clean and dry under every circumstance. You want the, the crankcase surface clean and dry, and you want the surface on the cylinder clean and dry. And you don't use any kind of sealant on these because the sealant on this gasket is already been applied to the gasket in manufacture. And you'll notice that that sealant is strategically placed to manage all of that oil flow that we were talking about earlier. So this sealant is there specifically to seal off where the oil is being fed and returned. So don't put any grease on it, don't put any sealant on it, certainly no silicone. Uh, and it's not a good idea to try to stick it to the cylinder base and have it on the cylinder as you're doing the assembly. We always put it clean and dry on the crankcase and then take the cylinder assembly and set it down on the crankcase 
one piston pin at a time. So you put one pin in, then the other pin, and then drop the cylinder down on that base gasket assembly, clean and dry. All right, let's talk about the head gaskets for a minute. The original equipment head gasket is an MLS, or multi-layered steel gasket. That gasket has oil control mechanisms pressed into it. You see, all these areas are there to control, in this case, the pressure-fed oil, and in all of these, it's the return oil that's coming back down to the crankcases. You would never use any gasket sealant with this gasket. The Big Floor kits come equipped with a solid copper gasket. Now you'll notice that that copper gasket doesn't have any of those holes in it, all right? Now the solid copper gasket is aided in sealing the combustion chamber pressure by this 8,000 of an inch tall ridge that runs all the way around the combustion chamber. That presses into the copper gasket to seal off the combustion chamber. But, these, but copper gaskets, while they are sort of the default standard gaskets for racing and hot rods, uh, you really do want to put some sealer uh, around the copper gasket in all of these same places. The stock gasket gives you a nice little pattern. Everywhere that this is pressed, that's where the sealer needs to be on this copper gasket. You need sealer on the copper gasket effectively everywhere that you see one of these pressed indentations. It's really kind of that simple. There are a number of sealers out there uh, for copper gaskets. We like the old standby gasket cinch. It's uh, been around forever and works like a charm. Uh, it is a very sticky, it stays there forever and expands and contracts and works to seal off the oil and you just put a little daub on each side of the gasket around all of the, uh, the oil control patterns, works like a charm. There are also a, a lot of copper head gasket sealers out there. Spray-on sealers are very effective, uh, but you want to be sure that you get a sealer that specifies copper head gaskets. Don't use just a standard RTV or any sort of oil pan sealer or whatever. You want something that says it needs to be high temperature, high pressure, and it's really best if the package says copper head gaskets. Um, you should also be aware that these, another uh, issue that you have to be very careful about is that these gaskets are directional. You see that this cam chain area, uh, the intake side is deeper or longer than the exhaust side. And this gasket can be put on backwards so that you end up with very little surface area. Uh, like it will, it'll go on there and run just fine, but it will leak oil here and or there because of the difference in the width of this cam chain area. So the original equipment gasket has a marking for right hand. So you know which way it's supposed to go because it's got a mark on it. The copper gasket doesn't have any kind of marking. You just have to understand that this pattern needs to match. Oops. It has to fit the cut out of the cylinder like so. And that's it. Now let's talk about the head bolts. Uh, the question, we got a question about the coating on the head bolts because the service manual actually says uh, they are, that these head bolts have a coating that renders them one use only. Uh, I, my best guess is that's probably translation. It has nothing to do with any coating. These are in fact one use only, but that's because they are a uh, torque to yield kind of bolt. So they're, once they've been properly tensioned, uh, they actually stretch uh, and they come nearly to their yield point. Uh, so you really shouldn't reuse these bolts at all, especially not in a motor that you plan to not go back into anytime soon. So, and there are a few things that you need to be particularly careful with using these bolts. First is when you take an engine apart in all of these holes, you will find engine oil. Some of them will be nearly full of engine oil. You really must clean that oil out of there. 
uh, because you're going to do a torque and then um, turn torque turn method on these uh, if you leave oil in one of those holes these are all blind holes so they're they have a bottom in them if you leave oil in that hole and put this bolt in it and try to tension it uh, it can hydrolock because the the oil in the bottom of that hole uh, it won't move when you get it sealed off and you try to crank it down you're literally trying to compress the oil and it drastically changes the amount of torque and torsion that you're putting on these bolts so you can end up if you don't clean these holes out you can end up with a bolt that is up to tension that doesn't have clamp load on the cylinder head and cylinder so it is hypercritical that you clean these holes out and they really should be for starters they should be clean and dry then you put oil a drop or two of we just use motor oil we use the same oil that we're assembling the engine with a drop or two of motor oil on the threads and a couple of drops on each side of this washer against the head of that bolt a lot of the tension that goes onto the bolt and a lot of the torsional force is lost between this head and the washer and the washer and the cylinder head and then at these threads if you put this together dry uh, it will come up to torque and, and and the torsional turn and still not be pulled all the way down to the clamp load because there's so much frictional loss at this head at that washer and in the thread so you clean everything out get it clean and dry and you must put oil on the threads and on each side of that washer to prevent the torsional loss or the frictional loss as you're trying to tension this bolt down now your head bolts are in um, they're all cleaned and oiled and ready to go so you tension these to 15 newton meters then 35 newton meters in a cross pattern and the cross pattern starts with the inboard exhaust on the left side as number one then to the intake for number two then straight across for number three and and you use this same pattern for all of the steps so you do it at 15 then you go back and do it at 35 and then you're going to then the the manual says to do 270 degrees um, to turn them a further 270 degrees now you do want to do that but a production environment and a service environment uh, can be very different so we may, when we build these engines we make two changes to that process we use these first four in the cross pattern just like they say but the factory has you uh, the factory manual has you doing one two three four then five six seven eight so you're doing a cross pattern to fasten down the inside of the gasket and bring in all of the these are the pressure fed oil so you want to be sure they get pulled down first and what you're looking for at the end of the day is an even clamp load all the way around that gasket and we really believe that in service when you do one two three four five and come all the way over here and do six and then seven uh, it seems to make more sense to us to do one two three four we then do five six so we're pulling this cylinder down square and then we come over here and do seven eight um, don't know if it makes a whole lot of difference but we're kind of committed to it and that's the way we've done them all and so far we've had pretty good luck with it so we go five and six on the same side so that we're clamping all four of those and then we do seven eight on the same side and then you're supposed to come back in that same torque pattern and do 270 degrees of torque turn now we think then and believe that instead of doing coming taking this bolt and going all the way to 270 degrees and then doing the same here with that uh, that's probably actually fine with the mls head gasket but with this copper gasket we want to even out the load on that copper as we compress it a little more so we do three rounds in that same torque pattern of 90 degrees each so instead of going instead of taking this bolt straight to 270 degrees we take it to 90 degrees and you can just right we bring each bolt 
90 degrees in that same torque pattern and we do that three times now torque this torque angle gauge uh, is really handy and a very accurate way to do this when you've got the motor out on the bench unfortunately that gauge won't fit when you're trying to do it on the bike so we revert back to the old school when you're actually doing it on the motorcycle we'll start by putting a mark on the bolt. This one, nice clean mark you can see. Now we're gonna go 90 degrees from that mark and put a mark on the head. And because we're gonna do it three times, we're gonna do that two more times. So there's one at 90 and then another one at 90. So after three turns of 90 degrees, that mark is going to end up one, two, three. So that mark will be right here. And that's as good as you're going to get doing it in the chassis. And that looks like this. Oh, there's my socket. So it really is as simple as taking that mark and pulling it around to line up with that mark. You do that three times in that same cross pattern, you've got a head gasket and base gasket and clamp load that will stay there in perpetuity. Okay, and there you have it. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this video and got some insight into some of the more detailed things that are involved in doing these big bore kits. Uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to put them in the comments below. Uh, please like, subscribe. If you have somebody, if you know somebody that would benefit from this video, share it with them. And uh, thanks for watching.